From the mind of Mark Yoshimoto Nemkov. He is a voiceover artist extraordinaire. You may have actually read his articles. My first exposure to Jason Birmingham was reading his articles in Sound on Sound about voiceover. Because nobody cares about voiceover. So it's, it's very rare when the magazines actually cover our field and do anything for us. Which is a completely idiotic thing for them to do. Because you know what? Voiceover artists, we open our wallets. <laughs> the first chance we get, anything we see that, that could be like the thing that helps us get to the next level. We are spenders. Isn't that yes, true? Yes, it is. And this was, I think the first article was like 2011. And and like you're right, I, I I was always a big fan of Sound on Sound, but it just seemed like there wasn't a lot of content directed towards people that would do what we do. And they agreed on doing this sort of home studio thing. And this was at a time when home studios were still, I mean, most of us had home some form of home studio, but they were getting more and more professional. And so we, we talked about this idea of kind of throwing this article out there. It became like a two-part series about home studios and, you know, how, how to build them, what kind of equipment you really need, you know, to, to do broadcast quality stuff. And it evolved. It went into this whole, you know, recording on the road. We did one about recording on a cruise ship. And there's a new one coming out soon that you are going to be part of about... Uh, Recording in like even like in virtual reality, all these new technologies that are coming out. There's this there's, you know, voice over voice telling stories, you know, the, the it's the oldest form of human connection. And so these technologies evolve, all this new stuff's coming out, these new mics, these new, you know, VR glasses and everything else. But the storytelling part of it, the connection part of it is still always the same. And so that's, you know, that's kind of ties into all of the articles that I wrote for them and and hopefully a little bit into this conversation we're going to have tonight. I'm I'm wondering though because having seen the documentary movie 2001 a space odyssey, I do remember the um the monkey man um using actually a a bone as the first method of communication between one monkey to an, another pre-human monkey. So, you yes. know, I, I think that yes. that maybe maybe voiceover may have come second. Storytelling may have come second too. If you look closely, I think it's a Sennheiser 416 he's been. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the only thing I'd use a 416 for is to defend myself, I think. So it, so this okay, I wanna just I wanna this is gonna be a little all over the place because my energy is a little off today. It's a little weird today, but so I wanna talk real quick about this. The one thing that I loved about your article was was you were talking about recording on the road, right? And I think that really that that also applies to people who are recording in spaces that aren't really well well treated, right? And you talk about building this, this was great. You talked about building a a cushion fort out of like all the available soft pillows and 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 seat cushions and anything available. And I remember doing this on a trip once and feeling like I was six years old, building like a couch fort <laughs> and being inside this little thing with all the couch cushions around my head, like trying to do this audition on the road. And uh, I was thinking like, you know, this actually works. This, this is not a crazy idea. Yeah. Well, before I tell you, before we talk about that, I'm curious, what do you use when you, when you're on the road? What mic do you take? What okay. Do you, what so do you record? this, the last few years. I refuse to take a vacation rig because my mm. vacation now is it's sacrosanct. You cannot, you cannot bother me. I, I work so hard. I, I rarely take a vacation. I take like one week off a year and then maybe a couple of days here and there around the holidays when there, when there isn't any work. So that one week I'm going paddle surfing. I am not doing an audition from my room. If I, if I lose that job, and I have lost work on vacation. I've gotten emails on vacation. Are you available? We have work for you. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm on Maui. I'm not doing an audition from my room again. So, I mean, you know, my situation is I put my foot down. I, I, can't, right. I, cannot, I cannot mentally put myself in that spot because I, I feel like every day, like when I wake up to work here, like I am putting on my game face. I'm getting, you know, like in there. And then when I'm on vacation, I have to let that go or else I'm going to have a heart attack someday. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm, I am, I am an outlier. 
when it comes to vacation rigs. But your vacation rig, I've seen like the pictures that you posted. I mean, you take you take a U87 on on the road with you. You take a you take a USB mic on the road with you. And so what what is your current vacation rig? Well, you know, it started out when I was writing the articles. It was it was kind of like a test. I wanted to kind of take the good stuff and then see and then take the, you know, the basic stuff and kind of compare them on the road. And I think what I learned and, and what most of us learn with these home studio and, you know, environments is it's really more about the acoustics first and foremost. And so the, you know, the, when we build a home studio, a lot of times people make the mistake of just, let's just fill it up with foam and, uh, you know, get it de- as dead as we can get it. And when, when I was traveling, I used to do that, that same approach, you know, the, the pillow forts and just, you know, the put blankets over blankets and just like kill this, you know, kill any reverberation that may happen in that space. But what, what, what I learned, and I think what we all learn is that it, you need some reverberation. You need some natural sound. And it's like, you know, when you build a studio, I look behind me, you've got a diffuser and then you've got these panels. Right. And above me, it's a, it's a, so I kind of learned that you got like diffusion, you got reverberation, you got like reflection and you got absorption. So I, I was trying to get kind of a balance between those things. And a great example when you're traveling is for me, the best place to record is in the car. You know, a car is kind yeah. of like a, a mobile sound booth. It's built to be quiet. It's built for the music when you're listening to the radio. It kind of, they build them to kind of keep out the outside sound, but you don't have a, it's not a dead sound. The music, when you're listening to music in a car, it sounds good. And so it works really well as, as a recording booth. So you could park, you know, if you're traveling in a car, you're done there. You've got a booth. Just park it somewhere and record. Yeah, but in a it, hotel room... It's a little trickier. Yeah, that is that is very true. I, I do I do remember doing once doing an audition on vacation. Um, I brought a four sixteen with me, and the the only problem was that um, I didn't have anywhere to really put the microphone. So I'm holding the four sixteen in my hand, you know, sitting in the in the driver's seat of the car in the parking garage of the hotel, and I'm holding the four sixteen and I'm trying to find the right you know for for the, this environment. You, they yeah. should, someone should make, really, honestly, someone should make a, a little clamp that goes right on your steering wheel for your mic, a little mic holder clamp that you could just put right there or, or like a sandbag on your dashboard that you can put your mic on and kind of have it sticking in your face. Because yeah, yeah recording yeah. in your car is an option, I think, on vacation. It's a, you know, if you're, if you have to, you know, if there's something going on, like, you know. Like sometimes one time, one time I got a knock on the door and it was the power company, LADWP. And they were like, um, we are going to replace this, this transformer that's down the block that services your whole uh, neighborhood. So we're going to shut the power off for like eight hours tomorrow. And I'm like, tomorrow? What? And so I had to go. I had to do it. I had to do a, a gig in the car. And yeah, yeah and I, I hated it, but it worked. So did anybody notice? Um, you know what? I'm not sure. I, it, the client accepted the project. I didn't yeah. hear any feedback, good, bad, or otherwise. You know, it wasn't rejected. It wasn't sent back. And so that's, at that point, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I snuck one by. But, yeah. uh, but you know, in an, in an emergency, in a zombie apocalypse, the car will suffice for me to do my final voiceover in the, in the zombie apocalypse. I, well, the 416 is a great travel mic. I mean, it, it's it's rugged. You can't break it. And, you know, if getting it through customs is a little tricky if you're going <laughs> abroad because nobody really knows what it is. But we would, we would you know, like a, we have a car where you, the, the front seats have the headrests. So we would record in the back seat. Oh, yeah, that makes the more sense. The 416 would come through. We'd just set it down and it would just kind of point right at you and set up your little laptop and, and That's drape your... genius. You, yeah, I didn't, I didn't you know, think about that. Well, so. it, it you just kind of go with what you got, basically. Yeah. But but yeah, so that you know, then you know, nowadays, I, you got little mics that clip onto your onto your iPhone that are good enough. But I, I'm I'm really a fan of those Apogee mics, the the hype mic, the new one they have, which is like a, it has a compressor, and so it, it really it delivers exactly what you need. So I think the articles at that time. Um, they're kind of outdated because nowadays it's so easy to record good quality sound pretty much anywhere if you're if you're careful about you know your acoustic spa- your acoustic space and and uh, and you have a decent microphone. You know that that is a topic that has come up recently. Um, even though as of as of this 
this uh, tete-a-tete we are having right now. Uh, I haven't posted it yet, but someone has asked, you know, the question about really like what level gear do you need to succeed in voiceover? And, and the, you know, they're basing their, their observations upon uh, things that people have been saying on the Internet, which have aggregated over the, the last 10 years or so. And so yeah. things have changed so dramatically. So, you know, this one, uh, this Paul, he was saying that, you know, there's voiceover actors who say you can make it with a USB mic and some would say, no, you need a TLM 103. And I'm like, no, you don't need either of those mics. That, that sucks. You know, but USB mics are getting better. This Apogee yeah. mic, right? So, yeah. like, I've never used it. How, how, how pro is it? Like, how far would you gig with it? Yeah, I don't think I would use it in the, in the studio. Um, but that, I mean, those, that's a big, big, big question. I've, it's I've, a huge I've really, question. Yeah, I've thought a lot about voiceover and gear. And are you a gamer? Did you, do you play video games? You know, I, I suck at them. I, I oh. play Call of Duty Mobile. <laughs> and that's like the only thing I do. But honestly, I only play Call of Duty Mobile on the toilet. So that's a oh. that's a low TMI, but I understand that, you know. Well, the reason Because I stopped I reading act- sound on sound and mix magazine. I'm gonna get you signed back up. <laughs> <laughs> mix magazine has disappointed me so much I've given up reading on the toilet in favor of oh, playing no. Call of Duty. No, we're sending you a subscription <laughs> ASAP. The reason I ask is that I, I've always been a, a big gamer and I just like, <clears throat> like I just finished Elden Ring, for example. And one of the things that I love about video games and this, especially like this Elden Ring type video game is that when you start the game, you, div- you create a character and then you've, you're given like certain amount of points, like 20 points. And you have to distribute those points to certain aspects of your character. If he's strong, if he's smart, if he's agile, if he's, you know, and then based on that, you kind of determine if you're going to be a warrior or a magician. So, but you always have that, those 20 points you start with. And when I approach voiceover, I think a lot about that. I'm thinking, okay, if I have 20 points and I'm going to distribute those points to different areas, for example, if I could have, if I could, you have one category that's just pure talent, Mm, you're just like this great actor and you've just got this really natural read. I'm not talking about a great voice. I'm just talking about really good communication skills and you really can connect with an audience. And when you're talking, you're reading that copy. It doesn't sound like you're reading. You're just a really, really good talent. I think if you put like 18 points in that talent and then like you had a, a, an Apogee mic in your studio, you'd probably be booking jobs that I won't be booking with my high end gear because that's where it starts. I mean, that's where they're really right. looking for. And so it kind of you got to kind of gauge it from there, because I think the, the risk, the, the trick is that if you think, OK, I, I want to be a voiceover talent, so I'm going to buy all this high end gear. And then think that that is going to get you in the door for auditions and, 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 and all in jobs. It could work the other way, you know, because a lot of times when you have this really high end gear, you get so enamored with your voice and you and, and you just get you develop these habits that later are really, really hard to break. So I think that the, it, it needs to be an organic progression. I would, I would say start with your acting skills, your talent, understanding how to deliver copy, how to read copy. After that, work on your acoustics, your space, where you're going to be recording. And after that, go start building up your, you know, you got to have entry level gear. But then when you start booking the jobs and you see it's progressing, then start investing more and more in, in gear. That's my thought. At least. You know, that, I'm going to clip that whole thing out and drop it as a YouTube short. I mean, that is that is some that is some real wisdom. So, I mean, you know, you've been doing voiceover professionally for a couple of decades or more, right? You've yeah. been, I mean, you've been you've been in the game for quite a while, and so you have seen how it has changed, really. And yeah. and I think it has changed more over the last five years than it has in the previous forty, in terms of the accessibility and the the how how easy it is now to get a good sound compared to how it used to be you know yeah. there's there's good equipment available for everyone there's um the accessibility to find voiceover work through the internet through different avenues good bad or otherwise and you can you can audition now from anywhere you know and and after covid really remote remote recording is now uh really i think the primary way that voiceovers are being rendered unless you right. are working on a show. Right. So, um, you know, overall, I think, um, what, tell me, what do you think are 
the what are the two or three most important factors in voiceover today that people who are sitting around like on the internet um you know looking up like you know how do i get into voiceover what do i do and they're looking at information that that could go back to like 2014 right you know and we're, and it that's a completely you might as well be you might as well be looking at information that goes back to to 1914 at that point so what what are really the new considerations that i think that aren't as uh that aren't as that that haven't been talked about as much because they are newer considerations right yeah, I mean, I think the very first step is really be honest with, with yourself. I mean, be honest. I, it's there's a difference between what you imagine yourself doing in voiceover and what you what you're good at. A lot of times, people don't realize what they're really good at. You know, because I, for example, when I started, I I started in Brazil, and one of the first things I did a lot of is in Brazil we have these advertising festivals. And when you do like for Can Internet, the Can Lion International Advertising Festival. So what that is, is these agencies all around the world compete to see if they can win a prize for having the best TV commercial. And for that, they have to send in like a two minute video and explain what that commercial did and how many people watched it and how much money they made. And it's called a video case for these ad festivals. And they do hundreds of these a year and they have to be in English. And so I started doing those because there was a demand for that. And, and my wife is a voiceover talent and she, Simone, and she brought me into this whole world. And in Brazil, they didn't have a lot of people doing that in English. And so my talent, what I was good at at that time was the fact that I could communicate in Portuguese because I live in Brazil. I could record in English, but my background was more of a school teacher, a journalist. I was a good communicator. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, conversation about, are you a good actor? I don't consider myself a really good actor, but I think I'm a good communicator. So that's what I knew I needed to do. So I, w I would bring in my natural communication skills into that. And instead of trying to be like a, like a movie trailer guy or mm. a mm -hmm. radio promo guy, I, that's what I was good at. And so from that, I gained experience. So I think it's a, the first step is to kind of see what, what, who you are, be honest with yourself, Usually what you're good at is what you do naturally. And then just kind of figure out where, you know, the, where the work is, you know, where that, where there's a demand for that. And what I've seen, what I've noticed today is I think a lot of people, you were talking about how the market has changed today. Everybody's a content creator, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like in the, in the old days, we would like tune in the TV and it was kind of like pre-selected. The good stuff was on, you know, you had like four or five channels and then you had pay TV and it started to grow. But now you like you're competing on YouTube with millions of people. And so what that that's twofold. What it means is that everyone's competing against you in a sense, but also that is the reference that the clients want. So I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of jobs now where people are saying, Oh, you got to sound like, you know, yeah, like you're a YouTube guy or, a, or yeah. you're yeah. on TikTok. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that kind of goes back to the that kind of goes back to the equipment thing. You know, if I've had I've actually had several jobs where they've asked me to record outside of the booth on a lesser mic because they they weren't getting the sound close to where the other people were sending it and what they wanted. And so, you know, because they're so used to hearing people record on podcast mics. So, you know, it, there's times were changing really fast. And you've just got to kind of jump on that wave and, and see where it takes you. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I, th I just got a, a text that um, times have changed once again. And now all auditions have to be performed on an iPhone. Really? So, yeah. From now on, all auditions for any project need to be performed on an iPhone for anything anywhere globally. And this is from the World VoiceOver Council of America and Beyond. So that, there, is a, there is a governing body of um, complete fictional people sending out this um, fictional text that I made up. So You might have a good idea, though. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> because if everyone, if everyone has to record the audition on their phone, the only thing that's going to separate us is our performance. Right? Is, your, is your technique and your talent. Your delivery. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm, of the, I'm of the complete opposite. And I feel that... Um, the thing that distinguishes a professional is the 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 understanding that, especially in voiceover. So, um, you know, when it comes down to it, like you said, 
It really comes down to two factors, your technique and your sound. And technique outweighs sound by a, a great deal, 75% to 25%, I think, overall. Right. You know, because I know that, I know that like, casting directors who get, like, 65, 100 auditions for something, when, when they're going through to listen to these things, it's like, click, you hit play, and you have about two seconds before they will just knock you out and go to the next one. Right. And that, that is a function of your sound. You know, it's like, unless you can grab somebody with your technique right away, you have to have, you, your technique has to be absolutely incredible to outweigh someone who has good technique and great sound. You know, it's like that 25% that sound influences, I think, the decision is often the deal breaker for a lot of people who do, don't have great sound. And so I think a professional knows that if it's technique and sound are the two main variables that, that may prevent you, the two obstacles that may prevent you from, from obtaining the gig, that professionals w will, will eliminate that one variable, the one variable that can be eliminated, right? And so it's like you, your technique may vary from day to day, depending on how you feel and how you feel about the project or, you know, your mental state, anything. There are so many things that can, that can change your technique from day to day. But if your sound is rock solid, foundational, professional quality, great, then that's never an issue. Right. Until, you know, I got this fictional text and now I got to throw all my gear away. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really. <sighs> well, I don't think you have to go that far yet. <laughs> But you, you know, you're right. I think one of the we were talking about the the point system of distributing, you know, your your points. I would also put a category in there for customer service. Oh, oh, absolutely. But that, but I think that 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 is almost that is secondary because you have to get the job and and work with the job. I'm just saying, like blind, you know, I because a lot of people, you know, there there are a lot of folks who watch uh, my YouTube channel. Right. Who are who are starting out, who are trying to get established, who are, you know, people, people are grinders. You know, I'm not people aren't watching this show who are like top level professionals. You know, we're all grinders out there and uh, we're working class lunch pail voiceover dudes and and ladies. And I think that that overall, like like you said, once you start to establish a relationship, once you get the job, customer service is paramount. You know, right. that, that will distinguish you from the person who doesn't know how to handle uh, communicating with a client. Yeah. So that, that's something actually we should talk about in the next video because we are going to take a break. This has been great. This has been part one. So part two is coming up tomorrow. Stick around. We got a lot more to talk about because, Jason, you really have to tell me more about what it's like working as as an American ex expatriate in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I think that would be really, really cool. I want to hear more about that. Absolutely. All right. So uh, check back in tomorrow. More with Jason Birmingham. Until then, this is Mark Yoshimoto Nemkov and Jason Birmingham, Fading to Black.